I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, the continuing response to the horrific tragedy in Pittsburgh this past Saturday at the Tree of Life congregation. Again, I'm sure you all know that 11 members of the congregation were murdered by a gunman who entered the building near the start of Shabbat morning services and began spraying the room with rifle fire. Eleven Jews there to celebrate Shabbat were murdered. Had the gunman arrived later in the morning, there would have been many more people at the service, and the number of casualties, dead and wounded, would have been much worse. And I want to say again, everyone here at JBS, and I'm sure every one of you who's part of the JBS viewing family, sends our deepest, most profound condolences to the families who lost loved ones in this senseless act of a madman. And we all join in an embrace of the Tree of Life congregation and the entire Jewish community of Pittsburgh. We are all one family, each of us responsible for the well-being of the other. And I am so very, very sorry. This is not the first mass shooting in 2018. This past September, six people were murdered in a mass shooting in Bakersfield, California. And the two worst mass shootings of the year, one took place in Santa Fe High School, when in May, eight students and two teachers were shot to death. And the deadliest mass shooting of the year took 17 lives at the Stoneham Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. Of course, it's not about the number murdered. Every mass shooting is a human tragedy. Every individual death is of cosmic importance. But when it's family, there's a searing pain. It takes one's breath away. It is unbelievable. And for Jews who have a long memory, easily going back some 80 years, when an entire civilization went mad and aided in the attempted systematic murder of every Jew on the planet, when Jews were gassed and incinerated and butchered in the cruelest ways unimaginable. And only because they were Jews. So when one madman enters a synagogue spewing hatred of Jews and murders Jews because, only because they are Jews, that event evokes, again, waking nightmares that have an even more devastating effect on the Jewish community. What we've witnessed in the aftermath of the murders is a tsunami of goodness and solidarity. The entire Jewish world is expressing unity and solidarity with the entire Jewish community of Pittsburgh in its moment of indescribable pain and grief. And no less important, non-Jewish America, from the halls of government to the man and woman in the street, Americans everywhere, are standing with the Jewish community, rejecting hate in general and anti-Semitism in particular as an anathema to American life and American social fabric. No Jew should miss this message, the message America is sending us in the midst of our grief. The message is that the Jew is an intricate, vital, indispensable part of the fabric of American life, as is any other American. This is not a country of hate. It is not a country where Jews need fear. What Jews do need to do now is have time to grieve, to mourn, to lay our dead to rest, and to begin a healing process. Of course, many questions are being asked about the proper Jewish response 
And so I'm very pleased to have on our JBS phones now a man who is in the forefront of fighting against all forms of anti-Semitism everywhere in the world, but especially in the halls of academia, Charles Small, founding director of ISCAP, the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism and Policy, and he's a dear friend whom you've seen many times here on JBS. Thank you so much for joining us again, Charles. Uh, I'm honored to be with you again, Mark, and uh, it's unfortunate, an unfortunate occasion that uh, I get to speak with you. Uh, it's a, yeah, a very heart-wrenching, horrific uh, incident that took place uh, close to home. This is yeah. our home. So, yes. Yeah, very sad. Yes. Very, yeah. I, I want to know what your reaction was. Again, look, you, your professional work brings you into a certain kind of contact with the, kind, the attempts to, to undermine the state of Israel and to really go after the Jewish people. So it's, I'm curious to know, Charles, what your reaction was when you learned of Pittsburgh. Um, I think my reaction, it's actually difficult to describe, I think, like many people. It was one of, uh, of devastation, of shock. That uh, On a Shabbat morning in a sanctuary, in a synagogue, somebody so depraved with hatred would carry out such, a, such an action, such an act, such a, a cruel and devastating act. It's terrible. Mm -hmm. It's really terrible. So... Yeah, so shock and horror and devastation. It's it's difficult to even articulate uh, what I felt. Absolutely, what I, feel. I understand completely. Yeah, and I think your opening remarks were were very, very good. And, you know, as, as good as we can articulate in these difficult times. You spoke well. I Thank you. It. Thank you, Charles. What do you think it means? Does it have a larger meaning? And I'm look. I've been taking the position that there have been multiple mass murders over the years. It is becoming almost, almost ho-hum, as terrible as that may be. And, you know, when children are the victims, it evokes a certain kind of extreme ex response, appropriately so. But they seem to be, all of these mass murders, seem to be the act of, number one, individuals, not groups, who are not only motivated out of some sense of hate, but are severely mentally disturbed, mentally ill. So I want to hear from your perspective as the director of ISCAP, to what extent do you worry that when a lunatic goes into a synagogue sanctuary in Pittsburgh, and kills 11 people. It is, there's something larger to the story than simply an isolated incident. Yeah, so I think we have to, uh, I think we have to get beyond the description and, and go deeper into analysis. Um, what, ha what happened in Pittsburgh, I think, is part of a larger issue, a much larger issue. And I think we have to, as a community, really understand what anti-Semitism is today, not only historically, but what it is today, and what are the manifestations of anti-Semitism, and how was this, this act, which was clearly anti-Semitic, and, and yes, there's mental illness in the United States of America that's a, a significant social and medical problem that needs to be addressed. Um, yes, there's serious gun control issues in the United States of America that hopefully one day could be addressed. But I don't think this diminishes the fact that this was a brutal anti-Semitic act, and the person uh, who's alleged, the alleged killer, he, he's innocent until proven guilty, and he'll go through the process of a, a trial, but it's clear to everybody that this man was guilty. He went into a synagogue with the intent, with the stated intent of killing Jews based on anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, which are... Um, as a scholar, I can say, are rampant in the United States of America and around the world. And I think the, the, the community, our, our leaders, 
the journalists, the scholars, the rabbis. We really need to come together and understand the challenge which is facing the Jewish people from Jerusalem to Belgium to London and Paris and now in the United States of America. Something is happening and we need to understand what is taking place so that we can defend ourselves effectively. Tell us and, and to Okay. Yes. Charles, tell us what's happening. And again, when you mention you mentioned many places on the face of this earth. You mentioned Europe, you mentioned Israel, and you mentioned the United States. Mm -hmm. Let's begin with the United States. What's happening here that you have seen? What has been published in any kind of um, credible setting that you feel expresses anti-Semitism that troubles you and that you feel the, the, the specific man aside it causes you to worry that anti-Semitism will grow in the United States. What have you seen that I haven't seen? Right. So I'm not sure what you haven't seen. I know you're, you're well-versed and educated <laughs> on these issues. Uh, but having said that, from my perspective, I think we really need to look at the root cause of anti-Semitism. So, so what is the ideology of anti-Semitism? And what does the extreme right in this country, white supremacists, anti-Semites, extreme nationalists, xenophobes. What do they have in common with the extreme left? Um, people who are engaged in the BDS movement, the attack on Jewish peoplehood, the attack on the, on, on, on the very right of Israel to exist as the homeland of the Jewish people, the extreme left. What do they have in common with the extreme right? And what does the extreme right and the extreme left have in common with political Islam? And if we look at the ideology of anti-Semitism, what the three radical movements share is an ideological root in European anti-Semitism, in the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, in Nazi propaganda, and even Soviet propaganda that are based on the Protocols that come out of Europe in the 19th century and, and metastasize, go in various directions around the world into the Soviet Union, then from the Soviet Union into places like Syria, the British influence um, in, in Egypt, the creation of the Muslim Brotherhood that takes European anti-Semitism and even Nazism and fuses it with Islam, and the Muslim Brotherhood's form of uh, anti-Semitic Islam then branches out into uh, different parts of the Middle East, into Saudi Arabia, and even into the Shiite world, the Iranian revolutionary regime, which is also uh, has adopted anti-Semitism at its core of its ideology, pays homage and thanks the Muslim Brotherhood and the Sunni world for their ideological heritage. So there's a connection between radical Islam in the Shiite world, the Sunni world, and they get their anti-Semitism from the radical left and the radical right of Europe. And we are living in a time of great displacement. States are failing in the Middle East. Syria, I would argue, is experiencing a genocide. 15 million refugees moving around and coming into Turkey, coming into Europe. A reaction to migration. The reaction to migration by the extreme right, by the extreme nationalists in Europe, in France with the National, the national Front, in places like Greece, in, in, in the United Kingdom with UKIP and other sort of reactionary uh, political movements. Uh, you could even say Brexit is a reaction uh, to this sort of economic and migration crisis in Europe. And, and now, tragically, this rhetoric has also entered into the United States and into the mainstream of the American political discourse. So, and I think that we have to own the fact that there has been dog whistles, there has been the demonization of, of refugees, there has been the demonization of people coming from certain countries and potentially entering into the United States. So there is this discourse of fear from the right. And I would say at the same time that uh, the right should be criticizing the right, and the left has to criticize the left. 
the silence of the previous administration of dealing with political Islam, aiding and abetting the Muslim Brotherhood in, in, in the elections in Egypt, doing a deal with Iran which transferred billions of dollars and resources to a regime, a regime that uses anti-Semitism and is clearly intent on obliterating not only Israel but the Jewish people. So I think it's time that we, in the greatest country, the greatest democracy in the world, look at how anti-Semitism has infiltrated, has permeated our society, our discourse on the left, our discourse on the right. And I dare say, tragically, as some of our finest universities in this country, young students are learning to perceive Jewish self-determination in our homeland as racist, mm -hmm. as apartheid, as fascist, as imperialist, as colonialist. And we have tolerated this. We have tolerated this in our community, and we st we, <laughs> we've put up with it. So I think it's time that we take an honest look at the problem here and how anti-Semitism in the United States is rooted in notions of white supremacy and violence. And that goes back, you can argue, to the very foundation of the society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we need to take a very sobering look at what is happening and how can we as a community confront these forms of anti-Semitism, I guess, with an S, mm -hmm and reach out to people of goodwill mm -hmm. on the right, on the left, and within other religious communities. So, Absolutely. And I think there are people of goodwill. Absolutely. We, really have to, we have to go deep into what, what we're confronting now. Okay. And it's, it's more advanced in Europe, I would say. Yes. It's washed upon our shores. And what are we going to do? Okay. Um, when people talk about the right, the skinheads, the white supremacists, blah, 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 we know who they're talking about. When you say you are also concerned with what the far right shares with the far left, in America, who is the far left? So I think, I think the, the far left, when it, ter when it comes to anti-Semitism, are those who call for the boycott of the only democratic country in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, there are those who call for the, they, they demonize Israel. And many of us on the left, on the so-called left, perceive this anti-Semitism as just a problem for the Israelis and the Zionists and the stubborn Israelis uh, in the peace process. But we can see now that the demonization of Israel has led to the demonization of Jews, Jewish communities in Europe and now in the United States, who are intrinsically deeply rooted to, to Israel, politically, socially, culturally, religiously. So if Israel is an apartheid, racist, fascist state that doesn't, should not exist, then what happens to the young Jewish students on campus that are part of Jewish organizations and Zionist organizations? What happens to people who are walking to shul on Shabbos in Paris, in Belgium, in London, in Pittsburgh? They also have become targeted of this BDS demonization of who Jews are as a people. And this cannot be tolerated anymore. We've tolerated it in the media of record. We've tolerated it at the best universities in this country. And it's time to really look at the implications of this anti-Semitism. And how can liberal, uh, I, and I consider myself a person of the left, that's of where course. I yes. come from. How can left-wing people or social democratic people or liberals mm -hmm. get into bed with Hamas with the Muslim Brotherhood, with the Iranian Revolutionary Regime, it, how, how is that possible? That these are sexist, homophobic, anti-democratic, as well as anti-Semitic movements. Mm -hmm. How is it possible for liberals to tolerate that? Mm -hmm. It's absurd. Mm -hmm. So that's the anti-Semitism on the left. And I think when the left is behaving irrationally when it comes to Israel and Jews, we know from our history what that is. All right. I want to push you a little bit. On the one hand, when I listen to your analysis, it is fascinating. And I think you, you really enlighten us in ways that most people are not talking about. And I, you know, I adore you, and I can't thank you enough for always not only giving me time on JBS, but also sharing your perspective, which I really 
wish people heard all the time. He, here's the one place I'm not comfortable yet with the way you describe it. Sure. I don't think, I don't think, if one is a Jew in Paris, one thinks twice about wearing a yarmulke, kippah. Mm -hmm. One thinks twice about wearing a Star of David. I've got congregants of mine traveling to Paris telling me when they're there, they take off any sign of being Jewish. And a lot of it has to do in Paris with a growing Islamic population, and the Islamic population in Paris does not like Jews. But then you say in Pittsburgh, I don't believe there's a Jew in Pittsburgh who worries about where he does or does not wear a kippah, does or does not wear a Jewish star, before this horrific event, which I believe is an isolated act of a lunatic, yes, anti-Semite, but a lunatic. I do not believe he is part of a movement. I don't believe now the Jews of, of Pittsburgh are in any mortal danger. I don't, you, know, you spend time in various places in America. Right now you're in Miami. I don't believe you are in any danger. I don't believe any Jew in Miami is in danger. I'm in New York. I'm in Connecticut. I'm in New Jersey. Do I think there's anti-Semitism around? But real hardcore, where people are going to do something who are not lunatics, in, in, less than a lunatic is going to do something violent to Jews. Do I think that the, that the Jewish Center here at the JCC in Manhattan now has to worry that the JCC in Stanford, Connecticut has to worry? And, and look, we'll be vigilant. I have no problem with vigilance. And if they want to have police guard for a period of time, they can. It'll discourage another crazy. But my sense is, Charles, that the kind of anti-Semitism that really does exist in France, in England, in Western Europe, encroaching into Eastern Europe, that's a violent form of virulent anti-Semitism. I don't believe anti-Semitism is part of the American fabric. I don't think the American people are sympathetic to anti-Semites. I believe the people of America see Israel much differently than those in the halls of academia. And while I don't want to put my head in the sand, nor do I want to say the sky is falling if it isn't. From my perspective, as horrific as Pittsburgh was, it is not representative of some movement which should frighten Jews of America that Kristallnacht is around the corner or that Paris is here. What's your response? So you, you raise a good point and good question. So I would say, I would respond by saying this, that each society has different uh, political and sort of cultures. And I think that the, anti the manifestations of anti-Semitism in Paris, or even anti-Semitism in France or in Paris, would be different than Belgium, would be different than Athens, would be different than London. So the anti-Semitisms are based on patterns of migration. So you point out there are large uh, Muslim communities in France from specific countries, and they're predisposed to anti-Semitic uh, views perhaps more than uh, Muslim immigrants in Germany, for example. There's a difference, and we've done surveys, and we know there's a difference. So anti-Semitism um, manifests differently in each society, even though there's global trends. So that's, that's the first thing I would say. Uh, since the killing, since the, the mass murder in Pittsburgh, the anti-Semitic mass murder, I've been rereading uh, George Fredrickson's, uh, Fredrickson's book. He was a professor at Stanford, and he wrote a book on a, called The Short History of Racism. And I, I urge people to read it. And he looks at the, the commonalities, the common root of white supremacy in the United States of America and how it was not only racist against people of African descent, but violently racist against Jews or violently anti-Semitic against Jewish people. So that form of that strain of anti-Semitism is here and, and it's rooted in American society. And I would point to Charlottesville. And what shocked me about Charlottesville is the fact that hundreds of 
white nationalists, white supremacists, racists, anti-Semites, marched with no sheets. We are living in a moment in American history where, they, where these thugs are no longer afraid to go barefaced. They walk without sheets because I guess they feel empowered to do so. That's, that's troubling to me. I know that our office in New York City, we share office space in the American Jewish Committee meeting, the building, the AJC building. I always find it amazing that in New York City, in the United States of America, the most uh, culturally rich and diverse Jewish population perhaps in the world, in New York, the AJC building and other Jewish institutions in New York don't put up big signs that in neon lights, like every other business does, that we're here, that we have a big building in New York and we have a strong presence. No. For security reasons, that's never been done. And I've watched over the last 10 years the security of the AJC building and other Jewish institutions in the United States of America, including JCCs and synagogues all over the country, harden their security on a consistent and regular basis over the years. Why is that happening? Why is that happening? And what does that mean mm -hmm. when our institutions are doing that? Mm -hmm. And I think we can point to the ADL survey, which clearly shows an increase of anti-Semitic acts and perceptions and views over the years. So I think there's a long history of this. Um, the sky is not falling. I still think, you know, the United States of America is a great country. The rule of law is here. It's a, it's a strong, stable country. Um, but I also think that we have to be weary and, and point to some of the discourse that um, our political leaders, our media leaders have been engaged in for the last several years. I've never seen anything like this. Mark, you and I had a conversation about a month ago where I was saying I fear the, the threat of violence in this society. Um, and... You know, I think other people have been articulating those views. So I think it's very important to take a step back from that type of rhetoric uh, that demonizes the other, that demonizes Jews or other, other minorities, but also people who have different political beliefs than we do. And to take a step back and to really look at our commonalities, look at our shared democratic values, and, and take a breath. And um, I think together understand the threats that we face as a community and the, challenge that, the, the challenges that are posed to us as a society today. Charles, it is always fabulous to talk to you. It is only because I'm out of time. I have to have you in studio when I have you for an hour on L'Chaim, and I can push and push and push. So many things you say are so fascinating, and they evoke questions in me that I want answers to. So we will plan to do that soon. I know ISCAP is doing so well for you. You're in Oxford. You're all over the world now. And I wish you kol tu v'hatzlacha. And you and I are going to do wonderful things with ISCAP on JBS. We'll announce that in the near future. But you know how much I love you and thank you for all the time you give us on JBS. And Mark, thank you for everything you're doing to the, for our community and the voice that you give our community. It's very important during the, more so as time goes on, more and more important. And the work that you guys are doing there is amazing. Thank you. So continued strength to you. Thank you. And your team. The thank thoughts you. of Charles Small, founding director of ISCAP, the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism and Policy. My thanks, as always, to our director today, which is Serge Goldberg. Fabulous job, Serge. And to the producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.